Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What a beautiful night. I'm glad all of you were able to uh, make room in your schedule to be here this evening. We're talking about uh, no room in our lives for this. Hmm. But you made room in your life for this, so you could be here this evening as we celebrate the, uh, the birth of Christ. And uh, I'm Pastor Jeff Nicholas, and my worship leader for this evening is my wife, uh, Pastor Jean Nicholas. Good to have you here, too. Well, thank you. We're going to have some special music. Uh, a couple of, uh, let's see, a, a duet will be sung by Steve and Mary Strassman. We have our choir that's going to sing a special piece. We have our praise band. Uh, they're going to be playing from on high, so they'll be like the angels from above. And let's see, do we have another one? And then we'll have a duet later on, too. And yes, so we are looking forward to that. Duet. Piano duet. You know, I, I was wondering, did you ever think things get overwhelming even for God? Where, you know, God might say, there's just no room for this kind of stuff? I don't think so. No? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Well, I, I have a story. That's, it's an ancient story. I think it was told, must have been about a thousand years ago or so. It's in the legends of the oh, Holy really? Grail or something like that. Yeah. It's a... Uh, Hmm. It's that, you know, one day the Lord decided to visit the earth and take a little stroll. Walking down the road, the Lord encountered this poor man that was just crying. And so God said, why are you crying, my son? And the guy said, well, um, I was blind and I've never seen a sunset. So the Lord touched him and he was mm -hmm. able to see a sunset. That was, that was wonderful. And then the legend goes on, the Lord continued down the road and saw another man crying and said, why are you crying? And said, well, I was crippled. I've never been able to walk. And so the Lord touched him and he walked. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah. Awesome. Then the Lord walked down the road just a little bit further and there's another man crying. And the Lord said, why are you crying? The man said, well, I work for the government. <laughs> the Lord sat down and cried with him. <laughs> Sometimes things may even be overwhelming for God. You never know. Maybe God has no room for this. Hmm. Maybe there's no room for any more jokes. That... I think that's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, maybe we better move on to something else then. <laughs> oh. All right. The people who walked in darkness will see a great light, a light that will shine on all who live in the land where death casts its shadow. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And these will be his royal titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Bright burns the candle. Its light ends darkness for each person. Bright burns the candle. Clear symbol of Jesus, light of all the world. Bright burns the candle. Warm presence, friendships, and family close. Bright burns the candle. The faith community enlightened through fellowship. Bright burns the Christ candle. A sign of hope for the dying, the prisoner, the despairing. Glorious light, holy light. Would you please stand and join together in the opening hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful.
live in the midst of wars and rumors of wars, who see oppression, self-centeredness, and brokenness on every hand, look to you, O God, to intervene. Let us hear again the promises of broken yokes and blessed hopes. Assure us that trampling warriors and oppressive rulers do not have the last word. Send to us once more the wonderful Counselor and Prince of Peace, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in the first Noel. of Jesus' birth found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was obviously pregnant by this time. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave
Lord, come share in the wonder. Love is God now asleep in the hay. See the glow in the eyes of his mother. What is the name? Her heart is saying love, love. Love is the name she whispers love, love. Jesus Emmanuel Love has come and never will leave us Love is life everlasting and free Love is Jesus within and among us Love is the peace our hearts are seeking Love, love Love is the gift of Christmas, love, love, praise to you, God on high. That night, some shepherds were in their fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of a great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem in the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby laying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God, glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to all whom God favors.
When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They ran to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. Then the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their fields and flocks, glorifying and praising God for what the angels had told them, and because they had seen the child just as the angel had said. Amen. We would invite our ushers, if you would, please, to uh, please come forward and receive our offerings.
please join me in our responsive offertory prayer. Joyfully we sing praises to God's precious one. May we hear the Christmas story and find Jesus come to stay. Joyfully we present our gifts for the work of Jesus today. We, we give, give thanks, thanks to, God. to God, source of all joy. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a moment, if you would. How are you, buddy? You're fast tonight. You are fast. You look like you're an fast F too. All right. Wow. You guys are looking very nice tonight. All decked out here in all these nice clothes. All right. Let's see. I've got something here. Hey, don't tell them all what it is. What is it? Silly putty. Silly putty. Who, who's played with silly putty? I don't want to have silly yeah. putty. Yeah. Well, here. Why don't you all take some silly putty? Thank you. You're welcome. Camden. Camden. Camden, you're coming. Did you guys get some? Camden. Here's Camden. Say hi. Okay, here. Have a seat. There you go. There we go. Do you know what you do with silly putty? Do you? You might not be able to get yours out real easy. You got all that plastic wrap around there. Might have to have your parents help. You're good. You got yours off. I got mine off. Oh, I didn't have any on. Well, I'll tell you one of my favorite things to do is silly putty. You ever read the paper? Yes. Yes? You read the paper? Really? What does this say? No. This is what I like to do. Sometimes I like to find pictures or I like to go to the comics and I take my silly putty just like this. And I go like this. What am I, I'm pushing it right on top of that reindeer's head. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, if I push that on there really hard, what will happen? What is that? Is that the reindeer's head? Isn't that cool? You know, if you really push that silly putty on there, you get the picture of the reindeer, right? And then what happens if you go like this? Oh. I'm stretching it out. I'm kind of ruining it, aren't I? Yeah. Oh, you won't be able to tell what it looks like pretty soon. Well, if you stretch it all out, how do I get it back again? What do you think? You think I can just kind of push it back together? No, you just have to go like this. Start all over again. I know, you try now. That'll be good. You try that. You know, what I know is if you want to... On this one, we want to. If you want to get an image of this, you push that down like this, and then you can peel it up, and you'll get an image of what's down there. If you do it enough, you're going to get a bunch of ink all over your silly putty and your hands. That'll make a real mess, but that's all right. If you want to be close to God and you want to get that image of God, you get yourself really close, and if you press yourself right there, really close to God, you might get that image of God's love right on your heart. Wouldn't that be cool? If you could just press yourself really close, you can get the words here too. I'm trying to. You're trying to? I'm trying to get that. Here, get this one. Here, let me help you push. All right. And you get that. Oh, look at that. I have the words. It's a little bit backwards, but it's okay. If you press, you can get that image of God maybe right on your heart. Now, sometimes it may feel like, oh, you stretched it. If you have that love on your heart, and then all of a sudden, oh, you're stretched. I don't know if I can keep on loving. And it just gets longer and longer and longer. And pretty soon you think, oh, boy, now what do I do? You know what God does? Let's just start all over again. And then you can get that image of God stuck right on your heart again. You can always do that. And God did that so long ago when Jesus was born on Christmas Day. Hey, buddy. I know. I'm talking. I'm talking. No, I'm Camden, talking. I, <laughs> I know. So we have that image of God on our heart that God was born and Jesus came so many years ago and we can always have a good start and we can start again. Let's say a prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that your image can be on our hearts no matter how far we stretch it. That image of love can still come back. Help us to put that image on our hearts and live with that and share your story. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.
All right, thank you guys. Everybody up here in the front pew, if there were some other kids who didn't feel comfortable coming up. That should have waken us up here a little bit if you were sleeping. I want to share with you a, a couple of scriptures, just a couple of short passages here that are listed in your uh, bulletins. First one is out of the Gospel of Luke. It says, And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first child, a son. 
She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the village inn. And then from Matthew's gospel, this was after King Herod had heard as the Magi were coming in that they were seeking to find where the king of the Jews was to be born. And it says this in the third verse, Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During the season of Advent, we've talked about getting ourselves an Advent attitude. Now, sometimes when you talk about having an attitude, it's um, not always so good. But in this time of the year, an Advent attitude is something just a little bit different. It's an edgy thing, and yet we're still expecting something to happen, but something that would be good and positive, something that would fill us with a joy that we're not normally able to find. We took some time and we talked about you know, what it's like if we're really overwhelmed. When you start the season of Advent, you know Christmas is right around the corner. And, and so you can look at all the things that you have to do. Set up your trees, decorate your lawn, going shopping, wrapping presents. If I'm talking now and you're thinking, oh, you're getting all anxious. I'm not done with any of it yet. I've got to go home tonight and finish it. If you get to that point where, you get, you get to, where you're just too overwhelmed to care. Well, through all of this, we talked to ourselves and, and we said, instead of finding ways that we're so overwhelmed by all of it, maybe we find a way to put some of that beside us and find a way that, to find peace. Instead of being overwhelmed with everything that's there, think of the joy that's there and let our souls find some peace. We reminded ourselves that God is, is uh, not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. The next week we, we uh, went on and we wanted to find, find out if we could see the hope. And sometimes when we try to see the hope, we find ourselves blinded by all the things that are in the way. We find all of this activity in front of us and maybe we get a little bit crabby. Maybe we just miss the point completely. Maybe we want to ignore the point. But if we miss it and we ignore it and we let ourselves become blind to this, we won't be able to see the promise of hope. In the third week, we invited ourselves to listen to listen for the joy that we might find. Sometimes we get a little bit too lazy to listen and we don't want to hear through all the noise that's going on all around us. But somewhere during the season, find a way and a place where you can seek stillness and peace all among all the noise. And then we'll hear that sound of joy. We ask ourselves, what would it take to get the message of the good news across? What would it take for us to hear that good news message in our lives? And what would it take for us to help someone else to hear, maybe a friend or a family member? What would it take to have our community hear that good news? How far would you go? What would you do? There's a story about a, one of the pastors who, uh, in a community, and, and he knew it was Christmas time, and there was a person that he'd been praying for, and he had always wanted to invite him to church, and knew the person just kept saying no and no again and again. He thought, well, it's Christmas time, so I'll go and I'll, I'll ask this person one more time because at Christmas, everyone's open to something a little bit. There's the story and the joy, so maybe I'll invite them and, and they'll come to church. And so the pastor goes to this man and, and uh, was inviting him to church. And Well, it turns out this man was a producer of uh, some fine uh, peach brandy. So he told the pastor, he said, I'll attend your church if you'll drink some of the brandy and admit to doing so in front of the entire congregation. So being a good preacher that he was, he drank up. Sunday morning, the man visited the church. And the preacher recognized the man from the pulpit and he said, I see Mr. Johnson is here with us this morning. I want to thank him publicly for his hospitality this week, especially for the peaches that he gave me and the spirit in which they were given. <laughs> you know, how far would you go to make sure that this message, this gospel of Christ, is heard by those that we encounter day to day? 
We don't want him to miss this message. It's an important one. Last week, we got to listen to the cantata, and maybe you found yourself just filled with this love. And we shared the story at the very beginning about the innkeeper who instead of loving, took advantage of those who came to the inn, got a little bit greedy and thought, you know, there's supply and demand, so they supply the demand and I'll supply the prices and, you know, raised it and raised it. I start thinking about this and if we think there's no room in our lives for this, just to hear the phrase, no room in our lives for this, where does your mind go? around the Christmas story. No room in your lives for this. I think, first of all, we go on the, the, the more negative side of things, and I think there's no room. I think of Mary and Joseph going to that innkeeper and being told there's no room. We don't have any room in our lives for you. We don't have any rooms for you at all. You'll have to go somewhere else. There's just no room for you to be here. I start thinking about that, and it, it's bothersome to think the innkeeper turned them away but it's even more so when you think of Joseph and Mary. They're returning to the city of their ancestors, the city where their family is. Why were they at the inn being turned away? Where was their family? There was no room apparently in any of their family members' homes to take them in either. Why wouldn't their family take them in? Some of their ancestors, there's got to be someone they're related to in the city, but no one would take them in. They had no room for them in their lives. Well, I start thinking a little bit more, and they were persons who attended synagogue. They were people of faith. Was there no room among anyone in their place of worship? Apparently not. Nobody would take him in. Here's this woman about to give birth. No one will take him in. And then I begin to just wonder if everyone looked at them and thought, they aren't married. Mary's having a child. I don't want to touch them. I don't want to be a social outcast like they are. So nobody would welcome them. No one would take them in. There's no room for this in their lives. Hmm. You know, about the only people that were welcoming of Mary and Joseph, there was Zechariah and Elizabeth. Later there were some shepherds. There were the wise men. There was Simeon. There was Anna. There was one relative who was open to them. And the rest were all strangers. And some of them, people that had no faith in the same way that they practiced their faith. And yet they welcomed them and they worshipped Christ. Herod had no room for any other king. When Herod heard that there was a king that was to be born, there was no room in his life for another king. And he was upset and he tried to plot and make sure that he could make sure that Jesus didn't survive and become king in order that all the children, two years old and under, uh, be killed. He saw it as a threat and he wanted to get rid of this threat. And all of Jerusalem as well. They were not welcoming of Mary and Joseph. This would bring some disruption. This would bring some, some change. There was this fear of the instability that was there. There was this fear of, of unrest. There was no room in their lives for any of this. Well, I started to think, what if we decided to say there's no room in our lives for certain things? We've been putting on an Advent attitude. What if we found ourselves saying, there's no room in my life for this busyness that will cause me to be overwhelmed? There's no room in my life for all the disorder that comes from voices that I hear around me. There's only room to find that peace. There's no room for the rest of this. What if we find ourselves saying, there's no room for, for the crabbiness? Oh no, I like a little crabbiness. It's helpful sometimes. But what if we say there's no room for crabbiness in our lives? What if we say there, there's no room to miss the point? We want to make sure that we get the point of the story of the coming of Christ. We don't want to miss it. There's no room to miss it at all. What if we find and say to ourselves, there's no room for unbelief. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for our, our laziness of listening. We want to find ourselves attentive to the story, to hear the words of the gospel of Christ. It's all about Christ. What if there's no room for greed in our lives? 
Wouldn't that be great? If we could find ourselves with no room for these things. We've been talking about an Advent attitude. If we could leave this evening and look at the things that there's no room for in our lives, it would not only change us, but it would change all those around us. It might even be a world-changing event. If we live by this new Advent attitude, let's say there's no room in our lives for anything. There's no room for anything in our lives except for peace. There's no room for anything in our lives except for hope. There's no room for anything in our lives except for joy. There's no room for anything in our lives except for love. There's no room for anything in our lives except for the light of Christ. If we live by these descriptions of Advent, if we put that Advent attitude in our heart from today and forward, our lives will be changed. There's no room for anything else except the peace, hope, joy, love, and the light of Christ. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for that wonderful special music. In the beginning, the Word already existed. He was with God, and He was God. He was in the beginning with God, and He created everything there is. Nothing existed that He didn't make. Life itself was in Him. And this light, life gives light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Let's please stand and sing together silent night. Whoops. to let the light of Christ continue to shine in our lives in all places, everywhere that we go and in all we do. It's been a privilege and honor to have served with all of you in sharing Christ's love. I do know some of you wonder what happens next week. <laughs> next week we do have a Pastor Ray Field who will be preaching. He'll be taking care of some of the pastoral needs. Our staff parish uh, relations committee met with our superintendent. They have a wonderful plan that they are excited about. They're going to send it out in the mail. You'll get that this week. There will be someone here next week. That's the good news. We just want you to know. But it's been my honor and privilege to have served you and worshipped our Lord together. Let's take our light and go forward and share Christ's light with all that we encounter. Amen. Thank you. 
complicated sometimes, actually a lot of the time. There's one simple foundational thing about Christmas that we that support. Did you know we had a Wednesday night service? Yeah, you know what that never did. Anyway, um Jesus came to save us and he wants everybody to know that. So we go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Please think about it. Thank you. 